Hey there, everyone, and welcome to Church Online. My name is David Morielli, and I am a pastoral resident on staff here at Grace Chapel. One of my favorite things that I get to do at my job is meeting new people. So if you are someone who hasn't connected with our church yet, I just want to encourage you to click on the link in the description, or you can head to grace.org slash hello online. We just want to say hi and send you a gift card for a free treat on us. And don't worry, we're not signing you up for a weekly newsletter and we aren't going to be flooding your inbox. And to those who are regulars with us, a warm welcome to you as well. We're glad you're here. Before we start our service, we want to take a moment to take a small step in making the world a more connected and friendly place. So wherever you are in your corner of the world, send someone an encouraging text, uh, a message, an email, a, a DM, a phone call. Just shout it out the window at the next person who passes by. Maybe someone is coming to your mind who could use an encouraging word or your affirmation. Please just be inspired to be creative. You can send them a link to the service. You can be praying for the right words, or you can just nudge the person that's sitting on the couch right next to you and just let them know that you appreciate them. Or if you'd like, you can send a blessing in the chat as well. So take advantage of this moment to go ahead and spread a word of kindness. Thanks for taking part in that. Today, we are in week four of our series, The Good and Beautiful Life. If you have missed any part of the series, that's okay. You can find them all on our YouTube page. And unlike Stranger Things, you don't need to have seen the previous episodes to understand this one. Let me give you a brief previously on about the prior weeks. Each week, we are walking through the acronym BLESS. We opened the series by talking about how the good and beautiful life is an outward focused life. And the acronym helps us to be mindful about blessing others. The B stands for begin with prayer. The L is about listening with care. And today we're gonna to be discussing the E. So let's take a moment to prepare our hearts for worship. I invite you wherever you may be to take a moment to get into a physical posture of prayer a posture that represents the state of your heart. Putting your hands with our palms out can symbolize an openness to be receiving, or it can be a posture of offering and lifting something up. Maybe you feel weary from all that is happening in our country with these pointless acts of violence, and just falling to your knees is a position that represents your emotional state. So whether it's your hands folded together, whether you're standing or sitting or lying flat, let's just take a moment to adjust ourselves and would you join me in prayer? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we take this time to observe and recall that today is Pentecost Sunday, the day that you sent your Holy Spirit to dwell among us. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Holy Spirit, we know that you are the counselor, the truth to our help and need, and the one who fills us with the Spirit of the living God. Holy Spirit, we pray that this very day to come into greater communion with you. Would you fall on your church again, as in the days of old? We want to witness your goodness, your mercy, your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And I lift up every person joining us online to you, O oh Lord. As we hear your word and continue in worship, please open our hearts and our minds to what you are doing. Give us the ears to hear and the hearts to understand. Reveal your boundless love for us this day. And it's in the living and loving name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. It's who 
have seen many searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we It's who I am You are perfect in all of your ways Perfect in all of your ways You are perfect in all of your ways To us You are You are perfect in all of your ways Perfect in all This love so undeniable I, I can hardly speak Peace so unexplainable I, I can hardly think as you call me Deeper still as you call me Deeper still as you call It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. Hi friends, two weeks ago I was at a wedding reception with some younger friends around the table and it was a sit down dinner and the tables were beautifully decorated and set, complete with gold charger plates. Now at first I have to admit I could not remember what those were called, all I could think of was coasters and I knew that was wrong. Well the first item of food to come to the table were the rolls. And being the obnoxious older person at the table, I watched to see if my younger friends would spot their butter dish at the top corner of the charger. Sure enough, the first one to take a roll started to put it right in the middle of the charger. And I nudged her. Well, she would say I kicked her under the table. But I pointed and whispered, you have a dish right there for your roll. That got a few others chuckling about remembering to work the silverware from the outside in so when the salads came out, the plates were placed on the chargers, and once again I nudged my friend next to me as she was picking up her salad fork and whispered, not till everyone is served. I smiled at my table mates and said, you didn't know you were going to get table etiquette 101, did you? When my husband John and I were in seminary, we worked in the cafeteria, and we sometimes would get asked, to serve a special banquet, either at the school or even at the president's home. And we were taught how to set a table, where to place the napkin in the center of the plate, and then the fork, knife, and spoon, fork on the left, knife and spoon on the right, with, of course, the blades facing the 
plate, then the salad fork to the left of the dinner fork, the butter dish, your dessert spoon up at the top, and then a water goblet and a wine glass. Now, if I were serving some Asian friends, there's something very important that's missing, but I've got them, the chopsticks. Now, when my husband and I were in Kenya and Ethiopia, our utensils often consisted more of a piece of local bread with which to scoop the food than actual silverware. Luckily for me, I had understanding hosts because one is only supposed to use the right hand to eat and I'm left-handed which would work well in South American countries, where they keep their forks in their left and their knives in the right. One thing I do not remember ever being taught is the order of who to serve when. Frankly, I did not even know there was an order till we moved to Texas and had a few dinners out with friends at their country club. We soon learned. The oldest woman at the table is served first, counting down then to the youngest and then start with the youngest male to the oldest. Out of curiosity, I did a little research on this, and the seniority of the eldest person at the table is respected in many cultures. In some African cultures, service begins with the eldest male to the youngest and then the women. Now, since I was not the one served first at the wedding last weekend, I don't know if our server didn't know the proper protocol or <clears throat> if my hairdresser just keeps me looking much younger than I am. Well, the meal was delicious, the conversation spirited, and we had a wonderful time celebrating the bride and the groom who happens to be a Grace Chapel staff person. Knowing how expensive weddings can be, we were humbled to have been invited to the reception, an invitation we were honored to accept. We are currently preaching a series called The Good and Beautiful Life, and it's being framed around the acronym BLESS. Be in prayer, listen with care, eat with others, serve in love, and share your story. Today, we're considering what is the spiritual and relational significance of eating with others? And frankly, no better day than on a communion Sunday. So be sure to gather a little bread and juice so you can join us a little bit later in the service. So do you have a guess as to how many times food and or eating is mentioned in the Bible? 100? 200? actually over 850 times. Now, granted, some of those occasions are what not to eat, especially in the Old Testament, but many are about demonstrating grace and justice, sharing, celebration, hospitality, and building relationships around a common meal. How does eating together contribute to a good and beautiful life? You can probably think of several ways to answer that question. I'm going to suggest a few. First, eating with others deepens relationships. I was thinking about our many moves around the country and how good it felt the first time someone invited us into their home to share a meal. I can still remember some of those early hosts going back nearly 40 years. In New Jersey, it was Diane and Pete Morrison. In New York, Harry and Rachel Heinz. In Wisconsin, Tom and Debbie Schwai. In Pennsylvania, Don and Lucille Marshall. In Texas, Holly and David Youngquist. And in Massachusetts, it was Teresa and Don Nelson. How do I remember all of these people? Because being welcomed into their homes was that significant for me. Moving to a new area, hardly knowing anyone can be a really lonely feeling. To this day, I feel a deep connection to each one of these couples, even if we do not communicate all that often. But if I were to call them up, we would talk like it was yesterday. Eating with others deepens relationships. Another way eating with others contributes to a good and beautiful life is that eating with others creates memories. So stop and think for a moment. Who has made you feel welcome at their table? Who were the last people you invited into your home or with whom you last ate out at a restaurant? What are or were some of your traditions at the family dinner table? What topics of conversation do you recall or funny things that happened? Here are just a few that came into my mind. My grandfather, Pop, at the end of the meal, would sit with his hand just like this, waiting for my mom to put a cookie right there so he could have it with his coffee and ice cream. 
John's grandfather used to pray long prayers before every meal, and each one ended with a robust, Amen. When John and I were first married, we had the professor who officiated our wedding and his wife to our little three-room attic apartment to dinner, sitting around our new little kitchen table that just barely sat four people. I look back on that and feel a little embarrassed, actually, but it was a special moment for us at the time. Through the years, there are memories of our girls growing up around the dinner table. Some meals were well-received, and some had to be coaxed to take a no-thank-you bite. And some may indeed have found its way into the waiting mouth of one of the family dogs. And then the meal no one prepared me for. The meal after our older daughter went to college. I sat looking at her empty chair. And just mentioning it brings back the ache in my heart and the lump in my throat knowing that our lives would never again be the same. And they were not, but that was okay, because now we have grandchildren at our table. And when John prays over the meal, they wait expectantly for the closing, amen. Eating with others deepens relationships. Eating with others creates memories. And third and somewhat overlooked and underestimated is the significance of eating with others because eating with others communicates value and respect. And this is a lesson Jesus teaches us in the text we're going to look at today. It's called the parable of the great banquet. Now, let me start with some context. Jesus is having dinner at the home of a prominent Pharisee on the Sabbath. And the conversation around the table consisted of topics that probably have not come up at your dinner table recently. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Where should you sit when you attend a party? Who should you invite? Just your friends and family? Just the ones who can repay you? Or who may never reciprocate? This last topic prompted Jesus to tell them this story. So if you have a Bible handy, you can turn to Luke chapter 14. We're gonna begin at verse 15 or just continue watching here on the screen. When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who'd been invited, Come, for now everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field. I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have jo just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became very angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys and bring in the poor and the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited to my banquet will get a taste. Now, before we go on, I have to ask, is anyone thinking or hearing a camp song in your head right now? I cannot come. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. Okay, we're not going to go down that rabbit trail because there's more to this parable than what meets the eye or what we might put into a camp song. Preparing for this sermon, I read the commentary Poet and Peasant written by Dr. Kenneth Bailey, a theology scholar who grew up and spent his whole career teaching in the Middle East. He has a particularly interesting take on Jesus' parables as seen through the Middle Eastern perspective, something we who are from the West might miss, but some of you with more Eastern or Middle Eastern roots might recognize. The Jewish custom when planning a banquet was to send an initial invitation announcing the party to which the people would RSVP. Then a second invitation would be issued once the feast was ready. 
Jesus' parable is about people who had responded, yes, they would come to the banquet. But when it was time to come and eat, they all made excuses. And what we'll see is that it's not just that they are lame excuses, they're actually bold-faced lies. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Now, Jesus is speaking to an agrarian culture. Land purchases are critically important decisions. Some of us might think this is a reasonable request. However, Bailey notes that no one buys a field in the Middle East without knowing every square foot of it, like the palm of his hand. The springs, wells, stone walls, trees, paths, anticipated rainfall are all well known before a discussion of the purchase is even begun. Sometimes a land purchase did require a post-purchase inspection, but the fact remains, he has seen the field. He has inspected it thoroughly. The purchase is complete. The land was already his. To Jesus' audience, this was not just a poor excuse. It was a lie. He did not need to go see it. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I am on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Well, after what we just learned about buying a field without looking at it, hopefully you can see right through this excuse as well. Bailey tells us that prospective buyers will want to see oxen pull together as teams before entertaining the idea of purchasing them, let alone five teams. He writes, if they cannot pull together, they are worthless as a team. In the smaller villages, the farmer owning a pair for sale announces to his friends that he has a team available and that he will be plowing with them on a given day. Prospective buyers make their way to the seller's field to watch the animals working and, of course, to drive them back and forth across the field to be assured of their strength and the evenness of their pull. All of this obviously takes place before the buyer even begins to negotiate a price. Again, the excuse offered here is a transparent fabrication. Then we get to the third excuse. This is one given by, as Dr. Bailey describes, the passionate bridegroom. For still another said, I just got married so I can't come. Now, this one would be funny if it weren't so blatantly rude to the host of the banquet. Bailey explains that even if we give this man the benefit of the doubt that he is recently married, it wasn't the same day or even that week because the whole village would have been invited and the host of this banquet would never have planned a great banquet so close to a village wedding. So custom would indicate it was not all that recent. And secondly, and even more significant, Bailey writes, that Middle Eastern society maintains formal restraint in talking about women. In a formal setting, men do not discuss their women. This guest is saying, yesterday I said I would come, but this afternoon I'm busy with a woman who is more important to me than your banquet. Surely such an excuse would be rude in any society, and it is intensely rude in the Middle Eastern world and totally unprecedented. Our passionate guest has accepted the invitation. He does not even ask to be excused. The entire response is guaranteed to infuriate the most patient of hosts, East or West. Now, these excuses would be, at a minimum, socially offensive to any host. Those listening to Jesus tell the parable know that. Eating with others communicates value and respect. And it's clear what's being communicated to the host in this parable by those filled with those last minute excuses is anything but. And now Jesus' listeners are waiting to hear how the host in the story will respond to being so offended. But it's a response no one expects, which tends to be true with most of Jesus' parables, because Jesus is all about doing the unexpected. Jesus has the master do exactly as he had recommended the Pharisee do earlier in their dinner conversation. The master then sends his servants into town to find the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame, people who could not reciprocate the invitation. And when there's still room, the master sends his servants out to compel anyone walking along the roads or taking shelter in the hedges. Why? 
Why would the master invite people that he doesn't know, maybe people who have no idea who he is? Because the master wants his house to be full. Notice the word used there in verse 23. The master tells his servants to compel them to come in. Why would these people need to be compelled to attend a banquet? Because they do not feel worthy of the invitation. They may not be Jews. They may be seen as unclean. They've been rejected by society. At the very least, they are not close friends or neighbors of the host. Eating with others communicates value and respect. Imagine the relationships these people will build who get to attend this banquet. The memories that will be shared for years to come and the sense of value and respect each will feel by being invited, welcomed, and included. We all want to feel included. We want to feel like we belong. It is inherent to being human. God created us for relationship. God created us to live good and beautiful lives in relationship with Him and with one another. And we can do that by being in prayer for one another, by listening with care to one another, and by eating with others, deepening relationships, creating memories, and communicating value and respect. Imagine if we at Grace Chapel were known as a community of people who pray, listen, and welcome people to our tables. What if we did not waste time coming up with excuses or reasons to avoid community, but instead looked for ways to be together? And even online community can work when done with some intentionality. The small group that I'm in is a Zoom group because we have people from all over Metro Boston to the border of New Hampshire and even one couple in central Pennsylvania. So we can't physically meet in person on a regular basis. Oh, but when we were finally able to be together last summer for the first time in person over a meal, we ate, we laughed, we celebrated a baby about to be born. And when we left, we hugged each other like we were long lost family. Now, if you are in driving distance of one of our campuses, I encourage you, I compel you, come to the banquet. Every Sunday, we feast on the word proclaimed. We are nourished by song. We are strengthened in prayer. Each time we gather together, we deepen relationships. We create memories and we communicate value and respect for each other. And more importantly, for the God who created us, the Lord Jesus who calls us to follow him and the spirit who makes us one. Now, speaking of the Holy Spirit, did you know today is a very special day? 50 days after Jesus rose from the grave, 10 days after he ascended back into heaven to be with the Father, the Holy Spirit came down upon the gathered believers who were in an upper room, probably eating together as they celebrated the festival of first fruits. The Spirit blew through that place with such a force that hundreds, even thousands of people who had come to Jerusalem for the festival heard it. And then, they heard these ordinary men and women speaking good news about the love of God for his people and the saving work of Jesus Christ in their own languages, for the Spirit had enabled them. And a new community was formed that day. The church was given life by the breath of God. The Holy Spirit filled all those who believed, empowering them to serve others in love and to share their stories of how their lives were transformed. Listen to how Luke describes this early church community in Acts chapter 2. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, if that is not a picture of a good and beautiful life, I don't know what is. 
If ever our world needed to see this kind of community in its midst, it is now. And you're invited. You're invited to start this week. So maybe invite a family or some singles or empty nesters over for a cookout. And don't worry, your table doesn't have to look like this. Frankly, my favorite picnic plate is this and my favorite glass. However you serve it, whatever you serve, it's in the gathering together that the Spirit shows up. Go to a local restaurant, maybe even with someone you just met this morning, someone, a neighbor nearby. Learn the name of your server. Pray together over your meal. Ask if there's something you can pray about for your server. And leave a generous tip. Grab coffee or an iced tea with a coworker and find out something new about their life. And you can do that in person or even over Zoom. Students, grab a friend and sit with someone new over lunch at school. You can just tell them it's an assignment that one of your crazy pastors is making you do. Friends, when, we, when all we do is think of excuses, we just may miss the invitation of the master to be part of the great banquet. But when we accept the invitation to the banquet, that is this good and beautiful life. We deepen relationships, we create memories, and we communicate value and respect. And as we do, may the Lord add to our number those who are being saved. And to God alone be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Our loving God, we give you thanks for the opportunity to look into your scriptures, to hear a story told by Jesus, and to be able to connect that story into our very lives. We thank you that you have invited us to the banquet feast that is your church. And we pray that you would use us as your ambassadors, winsome ambassadors to those around us, to invite others to come and to share a meal so that we might deepen relationships and we might create new memories and we might communicate value and respect to those who may not feel it. God, may you use us to help others see you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Friends, as you gather your communion supplies, I have something very special to show you. This is my Pentecost stole that was given to me when I was ordained as a pastor. It's a symbol of the responsibility that I hold and that I have been given. This meal set before us may be extremely simple, made of bread and juice, but it's also extremely profound and rich in its meaning. So on this Pentecost Sunday, when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit and the gift that that is to us in making us one, especially as we gather to eat together, I thought I would wear this stole to commemorate this very special meal. To know the world around us is broken, all we need to do is read the news or listen to how people talk about or past or over one another. It was into this brokenness that Jesus came to teach us how to pray, how to listen, and to build relationships by sharing a common meal with one another. And he taught us how to love. When Jesus was unjustly accused and convicted of blasphemy, he went to the cross out of obedience to the Father's plan to redeem all that was broken. He was the righteous one who gave his life for the unrighteous. In his resurrection, he established a new covenant of love and forgiveness. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to empower us to live for him and to share his love. And so we remember that on the night he was betrayed, as he sat with his friends during their Passover meal, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you, and do this to remember me. After supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink, each of you, and do this to remember me. And friends, whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we remember our Lord's death until he comes again and we eat together with him in his kingdom. I invite you to pray with me as we come to the table. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you sent your son, our Lord Jesus, into the world to redeem what was broken. This bread and this cup remind us that he is the bread of life and the vine in which we are called to abide. Nourish us now with this simple common meal and by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, make us one with you and with one another. We pray this in the name of our Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ, amen. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Now, I have one more interesting note from Dr. Bailey. In the Middle Eastern culture, when people eat with one another, there's a sense of taking into oneself part of those with whom they eat. Such is the power of relationships built around a table. So if you have not yet said yes to following Jesus, let this be the moment. Receive Jesus as you receive the simple meal, the body of Christ given for you. Take and eat. and the blood of Christ shed for you. Drink with thanksgiving. Let's pray. Holy and righteous God, we thank you that the mystery that is this meal binds us to Jesus and to one another in a way nothing else does. Let us leave this table wherever we are, refreshed and renewed in your forgiveness and love. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. So grateful that you could join us this morning. Before we go, let's talk about some ways that we can put the message into practice, a way to be outward focused and gather around the table. This summer's small group initiative will be about The Art of Neighboring. It's a book by Jay Pathak and Dave Runyon. Groups will start meeting on June 26th. And The Art of Neighboring is a four-week curriculum 
designed to help Christians focus on the people within our neighborhoods and learn what it means to be a good neighbor. Each week includes a video about six to 11 minutes long, discussion questions and challenges to compete, to complete rather, in your neighborhood. The central question of this study is, what would your communities look like if Christians took Jesus' command to love our neighbors as ourselves seriously? Lastly, check out the Good and Beautiful Life playlist on Spotify. It's bright, it's fun, and uplifting. Inspired by our multicultural congregation, it even includes some well-known songs in other languages. Our worship team put this together based on the themes of our current series, so go ahead and go to Spotify and just search The Good and Beautiful Life. Thanks again for being with us this week. May the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen.